Okay, so far we've talked about objects or meshes. We've talked about how to move them in the 3D environment. We've talked a little, about, a little bit about scene options, which is the cross-section and doing the wireframe renderings. We've talked a little bit about lighting. And now I think we're going to talk about materials. Materials control what the object actually looks like. So far we've just had things that were essentially gray. Okay, so now we can start coloring and making the actual meshes look a little more exciting. Here I've done the Photoshop preset sphere and underneath it it says sphere material. I'm going to click on the material and up here in my properties I'm going to get a handful of options. Now before I get into these sort of individual sliders I want to point out right over here I've got a little thumbnail of the sphere. If I click on that Photoshop does come with a short list of pre-made materials. So if I go ahead and say click on the fun texture I will get this flowery fun texture. Uh, there's some pre-made um, glass, there is some pre-made metals like copper and gold, iron so forth and so on. Uh, there's some stone in here, there's a couple of kind of earthy textures like stone and, and woods and stuff like that. So there's a couple of pre-made materials in here. Now if you go ahead and check these out and just want to get rid of the material afterwards, you can go somewhere in the list here. It says no texture. If you click on that, it basically puts everything back to the default settings. So Photoshop does give you a couple of pre-made textures to start playing around with. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of go out of order up here. I want to describe to you what these different sliders do. And what I've done is I've done a couple of comparative renderings of ahead of time. So I'm going to click on my layers here. I'm going to hide my 3D object. And one of the first options is shine. And let me turn on a layer that I've already created. I took two spheres side by side, made one red, one blue, and I've adjusted the shine on each one of them differently. This one has the blue one has the shine set to, let's click on the layer here. The blue one has the shine set to about 90. The red one has it set around 40. And basically the shine controls how big of a hot spot you'll get on your object when when the light hits the object, how big of a specular highlight will you get on that object? Now we're seeing two highlights because I have two infinite lights in the scene and when the infinite light hits the object it produces this hot spot. So the higher the shine, believe it or not, the smaller the hot spot. And the lower the shine, the more spread out the hot spot becomes. So that's what shine will do. Then we have reflections and roughness. Well, reflections is pretty straightforward. It's how much the object reflects. So in this case, I've got the red sphere and the blue sphere side by side. And you can actually see the blue sphere reflecting in the red. And then this is the red sphere reflecting in the side of the blue. So reflection uh, just controls how much of the surrounding environment or other objects that your particular surface reflects. Now, you'll note one little thing here. If you pay close attention, you'll see these little reflective highlights. This is from the environment, which we'll talk about later on, but that's generating what the object is reflecting. And you can see the little circles that are being reflected here, and even the, the red ball reflecting in the side of the blue one here. You can see the reflection fairly crisp. But if you look on the red sphere, you can see the reflection is a little soft. It's a little blurry. Underneath your reflection setting is a roughness setting. And the roughness, which is kind of a weird way of describing this, is how blurry the reflection turns out. For example, if you take an item and put it on a tabletop, that tabletop, let's say it's a wood tabletop, might have a certain amount of protection on top of it, like a varnish or polyurethane. Well, if you look at the object's reflection in the tabletop, it's not always crisp like it would be in the bathroom mirror. You'll see the object's reflection on the tabletop is usually a little soft and blurry, and that's what the roughness does. So it's a really nice feature to have. It, it breaks up the reflection so it's not so harsh and perfect. So that's reflections. Then there's an option called bump. What bump does is it creates all these little indentations on the objects and you create these indentations using, using what they call bump map which is basically a pattern you design and it gets wrapped around the object and it produces these bumps. This is like a checkerboard pattern and then this is 
I don't know, some sort of strange little pattern going on here. I uh, don't quite know how to describe it. But basically, you make a black and white image, and that black and white image controls the bumpiness of the object. And I'll give you a demonstration of that later on. But that's the bump. Then you have refraction. This is kind of interesting. There is two blue spheres in the background here, okay? And in the foreground is another sphere with a glass texture on it. And these little like kidney shapes are actually the light refracting through the sphere and warping the blue sphere on the other side. So refraction is if you had a glass of water and you put a straw in that glass, refraction is light bending as it goes through transparent objects and in turn your straw as it goes through the glass and the water warps and distorts a little bit and that's what's going on here. And I'm, you know, I'm not even going to spend a whole lot of time on refraction because you really don't use it that often. It also jacks up the render times quite a bit. These other slides that I've been showing you took about five or six minutes to render. Refraction took about 40 so it it really jacks up the render time. So let's take a closer look at, at some of these sliders. Now we get an idea of what a lot of them look like uh, when you adjust them. I'm going to start up here. There's some color boxes that we can choose from. Uh, one is diffuse. Diffuse refers to just the general color of your object. So if I go ahead and click on that diffuse box, make it red, it turns the sphere red. Click it again, make it blue, it turns the sphere blue. Now, next to a lot of these sliders is a little folder, and you can do something called load a texture. And what that usually means is you can load an image to be wrapped around uh, the object. So I'll get to this later on as well, but I can click on this, load an image, or load a texture, and that image will wrap around the 3D sphere. Specular controls the color of the specular highlight. When I go, let's just pull up my shine layer one more time. You see this little highlight, this spot right here? That The coloration of that spot is controlled by specular. So let's go back to my 3D layer and let's bring my shine down a little bit more so we can see it here. If I click on this specular and bring it up to white, the hot spots get brighter. If I bring it down, my hot spots get a little duller. And if I bring it to the red, you can see the specular highlights actually turn red. It's kind of funky. Um, normally, what I do is the specular to me seems to be a little on the dark side when it's living in this dark gray. Sometimes I just bring it up a little bit more just to emphasize the specular highlight. And on the slide that I showed you earlier, I had these uh, pretty bright, almost on a, on a white. There's like a, a bright, bright gray is what they were set to. Okay. Um, illumination is how bright the object becomes. If you bring up your illumination, the object just tends to self-illuminate. It starts to glow a little bit. And this is regardless of how much lighting is actually on the object. You are probably not going to mess with this a whole lot, so I'm just going to kind of pass by it a little bit. Ambient brings up the natural ambient lighting on the object, so if it's a wee bit dark, you can brighten up the ambience through the uh, color picker, and that will make it a little brighter as well. Again, illumination and ambient, you're probably not going to muck around with a whole lot. So down here you have your setting for shine, you got your setting for reflection, uh, the roughness again ties in with the reflection, it actually blurs the reflection, and then you have the bump which will allow you to add uh, a roughness, a texture to the surface of the object. Then you have opacity, I didn't have this in the demo per se, even though that sphere that was doing refraction had opacity on it. If you bring this down it simply makes the object go transparent. Uh, it's weird, when the object starts to go transparent, it might look a little odd. It might take on some sort of weird texture to it like mine's doing right now. Uh, don't panic, it's just the software trying to generate a semi-transparent uh, object. It usually renders out just fine if I start rendering here. You can see the object is looking less noisy as it renders out, and all that little grain in there will dither out, and the object will be transparent, and I will see through it to whatever is behind it. Right now it's just green, so it's not terribly exciting, but there is an opacity slider as well. So let me just bring that right back up there. So there's a couple of basic sliders that you can play around with. It does give you a couple of presets uh, in this icon here. And next, let's get into adding some image maps to the object. Here's where things get really exciting. I've gone ahead and I've created the pre-made soda can uh, that comes with uh, Photoshop 
and I went ahead and made a, a layer below it, uh, just a red layer, so the shadow and everything else sticks out a little more. And we've talked about going under these materials here and playing around with some of these sliders. Now, another great thing you can do is you can actually take images and add those as textures on your mesh. What that means is you can take a bitmap image, a photograph or something that you've designed and wrap it around the 3D geometry. Now if I look at my 3D palette and I look at the soda can mesh, underneath it are two default materials. There's a label material and a cap material. The label material is basically the body of the can. That's where you would expect to see a label on a soda can. The cap material is the very top, the, the lip of the can. That's usually some sort of aluminum cap. It's also, I believe, the bottom has a little bit of aluminum. Well, I shouldn't say aluminum, but the cap also uh, is the very bottom of the can as well, somewhere down here. So I've got the cap, which controls the, the end caps of the soda can, and then I've got the label material for putting my label design on the can. Now if I look under my properties here, earlier I showed you that diffuse will change the color of the object because by default they're just kind of gray. If I click on diffuse and let's say I make the label uh, blue, nothing happens. It changed up here my diffuse thumbnail but nothing happened to the can. Well, the way this can was created, it's been pre-designed to receive some sort of texture on the label. So at the moment, I can't just change the color of it the way I would normally do by just changing diffuse. If you look off to the side here, you'll see a little, uh, looks like, like a little file icon. That indicates that this has some sort of texture file that can be applied to it. Normally, you have to add a texture by clicking on the little folder and hitting new texture or load texture. Here the texture has already been created and you can go ahead and paint on it and manipulate it and it will get applied to the can. I'm probably making it sound way more complicated than it is. It's a pretty easy thing to do. You simply click on this little thumbnail and you hit edit texture. That will open up a new document and what you're seeing is the 3D mesh. Now this is a cylindrical can so the mesh pattern is pretty much uh, just the same. It's a redundant pattern. But if you had something more sophisticated like a person's face and you unwrap that 3D mesh, you would see in the mesh where the eyeballs would be, where the nose would be, where the mouth would be, and you could paint on the mesh accordingly. Now in this case it's just a cylindrical object so the mesh really isn't that complicated. It appears to me that this main area is pretty much the body of the label and then up here is where this geometry is where it curves and meets the upper lid and then down here this part is where it probably wraps around the bottom of the can and it starts to uh, hit the bottom uh, cap there. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to grab my paintbrush just to demonstrate and I'm just going to draw uh, a doodle across this label. La 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 la. Look at that. Now when I go back, I don't even have to save it. If I go back to my uh, soda can, there it is. You can see Let's go back to my move tool here and spin it around. You can see my doodle goes around the can. And right here is where the edge of the doodle was. It didn't line up when I painted on it, so I've got that seam right there. But you can see the doodle taking place. Now if I go back to the label material, click back on this, edit texture, it pops back open. And you can make use of you know all your different layers and you can paint on this and design it you know any way you want and it will update right on that can. If I wanted to change the color of the can I would actually just paint all of this whatever color I wanted. I was trying to do blue earlier so let's just wash all this over with blue and by the way you'll notice the... Well, let's go back I'll come back to it in a minute. There it is the can has turned well it's more of a purple than a blue but there it is. You notice the lines, the actual geometry, uh, does not appear on the bottle, just the paint that you put above the lines here, above the uh, wireframe mesh here. All right, let me show you one other little sample. I want to make a new layer here, and I'm going to make a circle. And let's just change the color, something that stands out. We'll do like a yellow. And I'm going to do edit, stroke, and we're just going to stroke this about five pixels. Boom. 
So I have a perfectly round circle here. Let's go click back on my soda can. And you'll notice the circle is a little stretched out. Well, that tends to happen. Let me spin around here. The way, whoops, wrong spinning. The way the texture gets wrapped on a cylinder, it tends to stretch things out just a little bit. It's just inherent to how it maps. So my circle is not going to be round. It's going to be oval. So there's a couple of ways that, that you can fix this. You can usually go in and fix how the texture is being projected on the object, or if you wanna keep it really simple, you go back into your texture and you can kinda of just compensate by eye, uh, by squashing and stretching the texture accordingly. So I'm just gonna go ahead and squash my circle a little bit, knowing that now it's warped here, but when it stretches a little bit to go onto the can, nope, and it did not stretch. Oh man, I do have to save it. Let's Oh, there it goes. All right, I had to save it that time. Um, it's looking rounder here. I'm gonna go ahead and squash it a little bit more. It's interesting. Sometimes you have to save, sometimes you don't. I don't know, I'll play it safe. I'll save it this time. And there it is. So it's looking pretty round at this end, even though as a texture it was really squashed. So you might uh, come across that from time to time when it gets mapped on either a cylinder or a sphere, anything that has a, a curve to it. Sometimes the texture gets warped and you might have to squash and stretch uh, a little bit to compensate. Now, let's try something a little different here. I have gone ahead and I've downloaded a Coca-Cola label. I'm gonna select all of it, copy it, I'm gonna paste it, let me throw out this layer here. I'm just gonna paste it into my texture and you'll see the label is bigger. It's sort of shaped a little different. It's a little shorter, but a little longer than the texture. I'm just gonna go ahead, actually it's a lot longer, and I'm gonna squash it and make it fit over the whole texture. So I'm just gonna squash it down and then make it fit pretty much edge to edge with what I have here. Hit return, now when I look at this, it's clearly squashed, but again, when it wraps, it gets stretched out a little bit. So let me save this up. And let's go ahead uh, to the can. Look at that, that is like almost a perfect fit. <laughs> it's pretty cool, huh? So this could be a label that you're designing for someone and you wanna show them what it really looks like on their can. Isn't that pretty sweet? Now, to finish it up here, let me go back to my 3D palette. Let's go to the cap material. And just to put something up there, I think I'm gonna go into the presets. And we've got a couple of metals. Mm, let's see, metal iron, that's interesting. Let's try metal steel, let's just see what that looks like. And that will go ahead, it kind of gives us a more grayer look, I guess, to our caps. How's it look on the bottom? The bottom's tough, there's no lighting, so it's hard to see what's going on there. All right, let's, um, let's go under our lights for a quick second here. Let's go to my infinite light. And let's just soften up my shadows and rotate this. Oops, let's rotate my scene a tad here. Let's just give this a final render, see what it looks like. Okay, now this soda can's been rendering for about two minutes and it looks like it's got about another eight minutes or so to go. And I'm actually gonna abort the render for a minute because I'm looking at it and it's not bad, but I wanna give it a little more punch. So I'm gonna hit escape. And I think I'm gonna start with some lighting here. I think I'm gonna add a second infinite light. And I'm gonna roll it this direction to give it a little semi uh, backlighting. That way it'll have a little contrast down the middle here. And I think I might even take that light and let's rename it so I don't get confused. I'll call this backlight and I'll call this first one the key light. I'm gonna to go to that backlight. I'm gonna go under color gonna give it just a hint of warmth to it, just a little, little bit, okay? And I think I'm gonna tell that light not to cast any shadows, because I don't wanna throw a shadow over here, so I'm gonna tell it not to cast shadows. Now, another thing I might do to give the can itself a little more jazz, I'm gonna go under environment, and we haven't really looked at this yet. Actually, before I do that, let me go back to material. I'm gonna tell this can to reflect a little bit more. Let's bring the reflections up, okay? And I'm gonna put the reflection at about, now let's see, I'm gonna have to play around with it. I'm gonna put it at about 20. That might be too much, I don't know, we'll see. I'm gonna click on environment, and what I'm gonna see in environment is this little sphere with little dots. And as I roll that sphere around, 
What this is basically indicating, this little ball, imagine this ball wrapped around my entire scene. So it's covering, this, this entire can is inside this little sphere. And this sphere has these little pinpricks of light on it. And as I roll it around, do you see the different reflections, these sort of streaky reflections appearing on my can? Reflections are funky in the 3D world because in reality, when you look at things that are reflective, what they're reflecting are things in their environment. So, you know, you, you stand in the middle of your kitchen with a spoon. That spoon is reflecting the entire kitchen. And that's what the surface of that spoon, you know, looks like. It takes on the, the coloration of your kitchen. It takes on the environment of your kitchen reflects in that spoon. In 3D space, everything's essentially a vacuum of black. So there's just nothing to reflect. So what they do is they make these things called environmental reflection maps, which is basically an environment that goes around the 3D space to reflect things or to add reflections into objects. So by default, Photoshop has this little sphere with these little dots. And as you roll it around, you can sort of control the dots streaking on the side of the can. And that's going to give it a little more pizzazz. And I like that you can somewhat control where the lines are falling. I might not want to have it streaking right down the logo and conflicting with the, you know, the type, but I do kind of like having it sort of on the edge of the can here. So I'm just going to put a little streak there and we shall start rendering again and we'll see what this looks like. All right, so again, this is rendered uh, for about a minute or so, and I can definitely see these little reflective streaks. There's a little one up here. There's a couple around the edge of the can. I definitely have one right here. So the can, I think, is looking a little less flat. It's looking a little more interesting. However, speaking of flat, the lighting seems to be fairly even. I have uh, an infinite light off to the side here. I've got one back here illuminating the rim, which I really like, but I'd like to have a little more shadowing to give it some more depth right down the middle. There's a little bit going on here, but I'd like to have it a little more contrasty. So once again, I'm going to escape out of this render. And I'm gonna go take a look uh, at my environmental properties here. And they have a color setting here. And what that does is it sort of controls the intensity of the ambient light. It doesn't straight out say it's a light, but, but that's essentially what it is. So if I take this slider, I'm going to keep the color black. If I bring the slider up, my object gets overall brighter, not what I want. If I take the slider and bring it down, by default, uh, the intensity is at 100. Let's put this back to 100 where it was at. So I'm back at the beginning. If I take this slider and bring it down maybe 75 or so, 60, somewhere like that, you can see the shadow getting darker. Now, what's happening is the ambient light is getting darker, so this midsection is getting darker, but the outer edges where my infinite light is hitting is staying roughly the same. So this is basically going to give me, if I pull this down, it's going to give me a little more contrast in my shadow area. So I'm going to put it down, I think I'm going to go to about 50. And um, I'm just going to take this reflection sphere. I'm going to tweak this a little more. Let's just, I'll pull that reflection up and over to the side a tad bit more. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and this is, <laughs> I could play with this all day long, just tweaking where these reflections fall. All right, I'm going to leave it there. Well, do I want to, I'm going to put a little more on the inside here in the middle of that shadow. I get a little on the word Coca-Cola. I'm okay with it. It doesn't stand out too much. Hmm. I'm going to go with that. Let's, just, let's let this render uh, for a while and, and see what we get. We'll be back. And through the magic of editing, poof, here's our final soda can. This took about eight, eight or nine minutes to, uh, to render out. So some things do get to be a little time consuming. I like that we got the little reflections in here. I think it gives it some, some depth. Uh, you see them up here as well on the top. I love the, uh, the rim lighting here. I like that this got a little darker down the middle. I'd like to bring, I should have brought that ambience down a little bit more, just a tad bit more. But other than that, I'm pretty content with it. I think it looks really great. Now imagine wrapping your own designs on here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna hold on to this. I'm actually gonna save this up because I might use this later on. I'm going to switch gears really quick. I'm going to show you one last thing with surfaces. Here I've made uh, a donut. This is another Photoshop preset object. Uh, I thought I'd 
change things up a tad. This is a shape we haven't used before. And I'm gonna go ahead and look at the material. The donut also, you can't change the diffuse color. It wants to have an image map placed on it. So I just, I do wanna change the color. So I'm gonna go edit texture. I'm simply gonna fill it. Ah, whatever, we'll kinda of make it, uh, we'll make it like a reddish color. Let's go in there, fill that red, save it. Let's go back and now I have a red donut or bagel or inner tube, whatever it might be. What I wanted to show you was the bump map. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to materials and I'm going to go to bump. And by default it's on 10%. If you mess with it, nothing is really going to happen because it needs a black and white pattern to define what the bumps are shaped like. So if you want to give a little roughness to a surface, you click over here and you do new texture. Now. The diffuse, they gave us a texture to work off of. They already had this little image icon over here. So we're gonna actually make a new image to put on here. So I'm gonna click on this little folder, new texture. You gotta build it to a particular dimension. Um, if, if you're doing a bump, it usually doesn't matter. I'll just do web. Usually I just make it square. I'll do like uh, 800 by 800 pixels at 72 ppi. That should be fine. And now it made the texture but it didn't open it for me. So now when I look at my bump slider it does have the texture icon. It's got the image icon there and now I just have to edit the texture. And now I've got a wireframe of that donut shape unwrapped. And now I'm just going to fill it with a pattern. I'm going to go edit fill and I'm sure I've got a couple of patterns in here I can try out. Let me, uh, let's see, something black and white. I'll go at this one. Oh, that's kind of funky. That will do the trick. And usually I blur this a little bit. Uh, a bump map, I usually do a little bit of blurring too. What, what's gonna happen is it takes the white areas and those will get raised up and the black areas will get recessed in the object. So the white areas should, should stick out a little bit. And normally to just have them look a little more beveled when they lift off the object, I tend to blur it just a little bit. So I'm going to do filter, blur. I'm just going to do a little bit. Oh, that's not enough. Uh, filter, blur. Let's do a Gaussian blur. Just a, oh, That's a little too much. Just a little, little bit. Just like that. Save it. Let's go back. Oh, let's go back to this document. And there it is. You can see I've got the texture uh, raising off the uh, face of the object here and this will add the illusion and this will add the illusion of roughness to the object if i go back to the material here i can increase the bump or i can decrease it to make it look really really subtle so you can add a bump map to your objects or to your meshes to um make them look like they have some sort of rough surface going on you can use any pattern that that you can create so this was a quick tour on how materials work and again like everything else you're just going to have to you know poke around and play with things until you get uh, real comfortable uh, using all the different options that are available.